Hello, you're watching EASD TV. Now, the story of GLP-1s is an extraordinary one, and it was one that was laid out for us so beautifully by our guest in the studio today, Michael Knack. Uh, Michael Knack was giving the Claude Bernard Lecture, the most prestigious lecture of the ESD programme. Welcome to the studio, and how lovely to have you with us. And I know, because I've heard from many, many people, how much they enjoyed the Claude Bernard Lecture this year. So this is not a story of triumph from start to finish. It started with disappointment. So tell us the story of GLP-1, Michael. Yeah, so before GLP-1 was discovered as an incretin hormone, and the definition is a hormone from the gut that is able to stimulate insulin secretion, there was another incretin hormone, and it was called GIP. Originally, this stood for gastric inhibitory polypeptide because the bioassay used to identify it looked at the inhibition of gastric acid secretion, uh, but the main action turned out to be the stimulation of insulin secretion, and it worked wonderfully fully in healthy animals and human subjects, but when it was tried in type 2 diabetic patients, uh, it just didn't stimulate insulin secretion enough to have an influence on, on blood sugar. So there was a big disappointment that something that created some hope because it was working through stimulating insulin secretion and should have the potential to be a good treatment for type 2 diabetes turn out not to be uh, what it was expected to be. So what made you carry on this work? So seeing something crash and burn, Michael Knack decides that he wants to continue doing it. <laughs> Yeah, so basically this was because I was working in a scientific group of people who had been interested in GIP, who had developed all those methods that you need to, to find out what it does. Uh, and then someone else came up with the discovery of GLP-1. But of course, being interested in incretins in more general terms, this was something that we picked up. Uh, and. Basically, when we did so, our expectations were pretty low because a Japanese group had published results. Yes, GLP-1 works wonderfully in healthy rats, but if you inject them a little bit of streptozotocin, which turns them into diabetic rats, there is no longer the same kind of insulin stimulation and manipulation of glucagon concentrations. And basically, we started this as a translational project and our expectation was we will simply reproduce the findings of this rat study, but then came the surprise. And tell us about the surprise, because it is an extraordinary surprise. Yeah, so we did two projects. One was probably of the higher scientific value. It was very complicated, and I don't want to uh, talk about all the details. The second project was a very simple one. We took patients who had type 2 diabetes and were admitted to a specialized diabetes hospital because people decided they need insulin treatment. They, they no longer had a good uh, glycemic control based on the treatment with the oral agents that were available in the early 1990s. And then we asked them, would you be willing to participate in our study, which was simply infusing GLP-1 at a certain dose that we calculated to be uh, helpful. And four hours later, they had a normal blood sugar concentration. And otherwise, they would need insulin in order to control their diabetes. And you must have thought at this time, this can't be right. <laughs> well, well I, let's recheck it. I was it. a little bit skeptical uh, after having studied one patient, but the second patient <laughs> responded in exactly the same way. And we had 10 patients, and the curves were almost superimposable. So there was little. Uh, doubt that, that this was representative for the type 2 diabetes population. So now you're hugely excited. What happens next? Well, it was very evident that this was a result of academic studies. I was working at the University of Göttingen in those uh, years uh, and 
our group was led by Werner Kreuzfeld, who decided in 1964 that he wanted to study uh, increase in hormones. But we also knew that the compound GLP-1, a peptide hormone from the gut, as such is not suitable to treat patients because it was volatile. So, so it had a half, very short half-life. Yeah, it, it has a half-life of like one to two minutes and you need the continuous infusion, otherwise uh, it, it wouldn't work at all. So, and, and what comes next is really not the business of an academic researcher. Uh, so you need uh, chemists, peptide uh, specialists, and some good ideas how you can transform a peptide with such a short half-life into one that you can inject at reasonable intervals. And as you know, the first GLP-1 receptor agonist was exenatide. Or, uh, before called Exendin-4 when it was discuss, uh, discovered in the saliva of the so-called Gila monster, which is a lizard living in Arizona. Yeah, how uh, many tales of science involve a Gila monster? <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, the original publications about Exendin-4 didn't mention uh, the word blood glucose or insulin or anything. They had a bioassay uh, influencing exocrine pancreatic secretion. And it was indeed a German colleague attending a conference like this one. And he saw the published sequence of exenatide and said, well, doesn't this look a little bit like GLP-1? And then he went home and they had assays for receptor binding, and he found out it is a very good agonist at the GLP-1 receptor. And then a small company uh, tried to inject it into people with diabetes, and they found out it has a half-life of like two to three hours instead of minutes. And so they got it approved at two injections a day. And even that, that was the first approved GLP-1 receptor agonist, if you compared it to basal insulin treatment, uh, it was equally effective in reducing HbA1c and it gave you the added benefit of less hypoglycemia uh, if you did it right, no hypoglycemia, and you saw on average a weight loss of two to three kilograms in those patients, whereas insulin typically makes you gain a little bit of weight. So this was so exciting. And, but then it's gone on because, you know, th that was twice daily. We're now talking about once weekly. Well, that is not the only progress we have seen. Of, of course, this is a matter of convenience and the patients love these once weekly uh, injections. But they also are more effective, more effective in terms of lowering glucose and HbA1c and certainly more effective in reducing uh, body weight. And we now know that the reduction in body weight uh, is by interaction with GLP-1 receptors in the central nervous system, namely the hypothalamic area, some nuclei like the arcuate nucleus. And there are neurons that have uh, GLP-1 receptors and we know the uh, GLP-1 receptor agonist that you inj inject subcutaneously can reach circumscribed areas in the brain and by interacting with these receptors they downregulate NPY for example and that simply makes you less hungry and you don't have the desire to eat uh, and so you just don't do it and the consequence is that the patients lose uh, a variable amount of body weight so the the HbA1c reduction is pretty uniform uh, the same in every patient where you prescribe this drug the weight reduction is highly variable and even those compounds that give you the most weight reduction on average you still see patients who do not lose any weight at all and others where you have excessive weight loss that really changes their lives massively where is this going next? So what we have seen is every two or three years there is a new compound coming up and it's more effective, otherwise it wouldn't be competitive, so all the new drugs usually are a little bit more effective. 
The last step was a very large step, but that was also a change in the concept. So the idea is, and there are people like Matthias Chöp and Richard DiMarchi who have worked on this concept, that you have a single peptide molecule that is able to stimulate GLP-1 plus other receptors, could be two or three uh, of, of these receptors. And you expect more effects if you choose those target receptors uh, correctly. And we have now uh, terzepatide, which is designed to stimulate GIP and GLP-1 receptors. And because these are the two incretins, this has been called a twin critin. Uh, and <laughs> it's a horrible name, a twin critin, sorry. <laughs> uh, and, and, and indeed, it gives you better HB1C reduction in type 2 diabetes compared to the most potent selective GLP-1 receptor agonists. And in addition, it gives you weight loss unmatched by previous treatments that were available. So on average, we are talking about 12 kilograms lost in patients with type 2 diabetes. And this again ranges somewhere between zero and 30 kilograms of weight lost. And what has been shown is that in those who have excessive weight loss, this will give you additive effects on the reduction of HbA1c. So you get into a range of weight loss that really matters in the regulation of metabolism and impacts on how your glucose metabolism is regulated. Uh, so it's a very relevant weight loss that you can induce. And even now, we have the next generation coming up. This is mainly animal experiments, but also initial human experiments. So there will be triple agonists addressing GLP-1, GIP, and glucagon receptors. And glucagon receptors add uh, an increased energy expenditure uh, which will impact on your energy balance. So if you eat less, that means less energy intake. And if you spend more energy uh, by increasing energy expenditure, the balance will even uh, favor more weight loss. And this is exactly what these animal experiments show. So we expect the next wave of even more effective drugs to come in a couple of years. It's an extraordinary story, Michael. Um, you've just given the Claude Bernard Lecture, which is you know, the highest honor that the EASD can uh, bestow. And it must seem extraordinary, looking back to when you first started all of this, that this snowball was going to carry on rolling, getting bigger and bigger, and delivering something that is a paradigm shift in diabetes treatment. I mean, how does that all make you feel? I mean, I know you are the most modest man in the world, but you must be feeling Well, it certainly pleasure. is a good feeling, and, uh, and, uh, but everyone knows this is not a single man's uh, work, so there was a lot of input from academic researchers uh, who uh, initiated this avalanche uh, originally, but also from pharmaceutical companies uh, who had very excellent scientists working on the molecules that really turned out to be suitable for the therapy and have been improved over time. Uh, but it, of course, it's, it's highly satisfactory to look back and show these old experiments and then see all this development. I have called it uh, an explosion of, of effectiveness going from old compounds to newer compounds. Uh, and and uh, it's, it's highly satisfactory to have been involved in, in this uh, development, which really will help our patients live better lives with uh, type 2 diabetes. And who would have thought in the beginning that this will generate therapies that turn out to be more effective and overall better than insulin for type 2 diabetes? It's an extraordinary story. Michael, you're an extraordinary man and a scientist. And do please look at the Claude Bernard lecture if you can. It was just a masterclass in 
presentation of data and telling a really outstanding story. Michael Nack, congratulations on the Claude Bernard Award. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you.